Good morning. Right, you all please stand. We'll sing our opening hymn. Bless that wonderful day. Bless that wonderful day. Senior Club used to be the Lions Den, you know, there on Douglas Street. I was born on Douglas Street, but you didn't know that. The house I was born in, it's not there anymore. But, uh, that's understandable because every time the rent was due, we moved. So, I mean, that was just, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. But every house I lived in, except 102 East Osborne Street, is gone now. That's what happens when you get older. We're glad you're here to worship. That's why we're here. Todd, what's next? 445, Sweet Hour of Prayer. Sweet Hour
Thank you. 
you know, so many denominations. You may have heard about the little girl that had the same issue. They were going home from church. She saw this one on this street corner and this one on that street corner and this one on the other street corner. And she said, Daddy, why are there so many abominations? <laughs> well, I don't know if all of them are abominations, but denomination, by its very definition, means division. Um, Assembly of God, Catholic, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Methodist, Pentecostal, Episcopal, Anglican, Christian, Church of Christ, United Church of Christ, Nazarene, da, 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 da. You know, there's a lot of them. And in the United States, there's over 70 Baptist groups. So you've got the American Baptist, and you've got to have the National Baptist, and you've got the Independent Baptist, and you've got to have the Free Will Baptist and the regular Baptist, and the Reformed Baptist, and the Fundamental Baptist, and the Evangelical Baptist, and the Missionary Baptist, and the Northern Baptist, which makes us Southern Baptist. <laughs> and we are a Southern Baptist church, always have been since 1864, mainly due to missionary support and the way that structure, especially since 1925, if you're a denominational historian, when the cooperative program was created, and how we support our missionaries. That kind of makes us a little bit different from other groups that do it the way they do. And I've explored lots of the Baptist groups as I've formed my own thoughts about where I ought to be and what I ought to do. We all got to land someplace. Did you know the biggest denomination in America now is non-denomination? But even non-denomination becomes denomination at some point. You adhere to certain values and beliefs. But a long time ago, I decided Southern Baptist was the best of the worst. <laughs> because all the denominations are flawed. None of us know it all. None of us have all the truth. So whatever denomination or abomination you decide to get part of, get part of it. And try to make it better. Try to make it as good. I like to think of denominations that just, just as different expressions of our faith in Jesus Christ. But... Denominations will never unite us. The second thing that won't unite us, if you're taking notes, is doctrine. Doctrine. Doctrine, people think if we all believe the same thing and everybody ought to get along. But doctrine can be very divisive. Our doctrinal statement as a convention, without getting off track, the Southern Baptist Convention is not literally a denomination in the classical sense, but I don't want to get into all that because you're not interested anyway. <laughs> But we're at a convention, and we have something called the Baptist Faith and Message 2000. And you can go to sbc.net, look that up online, and see all the tenets that the majority of Southern Baptists would agree to. Would say, yeah, that's what we believe. And if you don't know what you believe, you need to figure it out. You need to find out, and that's a good place to start. You may read that thing and say, I don't believe that. And God may show you something that you didn't know that you need. But all throughout history, if you study history, Southern Baptists have always disagreed on certain key doctrines. For instance, the freedom of man, free will of man, and the sovereignty of God. Usually called free will versus Calvinism. There have always been disagreements about how God saves people. Uh, working in gifts of the Holy Spirit. We'll be getting into the Holy Spirit here in a couple of weeks. And the gifts of the Spirit and how those work in, in the church to unite us. But they can often be very, very divisive. When I was a young guy, I was standing right out there in front of this church back in the 80s, and somebody told me what I ought to believe about the Holy Spirit. Told me how, how to do it. Well, there's differences of opinion about that. Uh, social ethics. Where do we stand on social issues? You know, the hot button issue, the abortion issue, the euthanasia issue, the gender issue. Where do we stand? People will sometimes come down to different places on that. So the uh, doctrinal assumption is, if I'm a Baptist, and if I'm a Southern Baptist, then everybody believes the same thing. Not so. In fact, one of the most treasured principles of Southern Baptistism is the priesthood of the believer. That is, you don't need a priest, you don't need a pope, you don't even need a preacher to go to God for you. You go to God for yourself because Jesus is on the throne. You see? Um, 
And you may have read an article this week. One of the largest churches in the Southern Baptist Convention, a huge church out in Southern California, if I said the name, you'd know it, got disfellowship by the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention because they believe something differently than the Baptist faith and message. And you can Google that, not right now. <laughs> if you don't already know it, and read about that. I'm simply saying the assumption that doctrine, a church covenant hanging on a wall, a doctrinal statement on a website means everybody is united is a false assumption. And at some point, whatever our denomination, and I work with all the denominations in town, the ones that will work with me, <laughs> some of them won't. <laughs> that's another story for another time. Not trying to get the preacher. That's a job. Because some of them will show up, some of them won't. But anyway, that's their thing. But I try to work with them. And I also try to work with people that differ in doctrinal issues within whatever church. In fact, there's probably differences right here this morning. Because you've heard me say before, you get two Baptists together, you've got three opinions. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is, Paul, pre-denominationalism, pre-any doctrinal statements, gives us the absolute, essential, non-negotiable characteristics of unity. Everything else, we may differ, disagree, hopefully disagree agreeably, and not go down and roll and start a new church because they don't believe like I do or I don't like how they treated me or whatever. And we've been guilty of that, as Baptists down through history, unfortunately. To learn how to love each other and work it out and get stronger, we just split up and then talk about each other. Awful, terrible, right from the pit of hell when you do that. Don't do it. Stop it. And if somebody comes rumoring to you, just stop it. Don't repeat it. That's how you stop the rumor. You just don't repeat it, whatever that is. But we've done that throughout history, unfortunately. So if you look at verse 3, he uses this strong word, endeavoring, King James. We have a new version that says, make every effort or be eager to maintain or be diligent. To keep. Those were the four major translations I read. Paul is saying to this church in Ephesus and to us that this is a high priority. And when you read that in verse 3, you realize quickly something that to me is very transforming. The unity in Christ always exists. We don't create it. It's in Him. But we're called to maintain it. It's our, our responsibility to, to tend it, to nurture it, to value it like God does. That's what He means there. He doesn't say endeavor to create it. It's already here. Our unity is in Christ. Not in our label on our jar or, or what we talk about in our doctrine or anything else like that. Our unity is in Him. That's why I appreciate those songs that I picked up today. They just keep focusing on Jesus. And that's where our focus always needs to be. So, verse 3, make it a priority of your Christian life to be unified. Remember, unity is not unanimity. Everybody believes in the same thing all the time. Or uniformity, everybody dressing the same. That's cult. But it's you knit to me. We're knit together in Jesus Christ. We're part of the body of Christ, as we'll see in just a minute. We're many members, and we need each other. We ought to value each other and pray for one another and love one another and do all that we can to work together. That's how we maintain this thing called unity. Now, let's look at these seven unities real quick. We won't spend too much time on them. They're pretty straightforward, but these are the seven Seven's God's number, by the way. It's the number of completion. These seven statements he makes that should always center us. And these should be the things, no matter if we're a Baptist or we're a Methodist or if we're Episcopal or whatever we call ourselves, whatever denominational spot or stripe we say we are, these things ought to characterize our fellowship together. One body. Now that's the body of Christ. That's the big C. That's the church all over the world made up of all the little seeds. 
That's us. So that's what he's talking about. Jesus is the head. That's where the brains are. And we're the body made up of many members. And we get our instructions from the head. That's where the brains are. <laughs> he knows what he wants. He knows who we are. And he leads us to do that together in unity. Whether it's an individual church or churches in a local Baptist association or ministerial alliance, cross-denominational, or all throughout the world. There's one body. And then he says there's one spirit. That's the Holy Spirit, obviously. Capital S in my Bible. Even as you're called in one hope. Now that's the hope of heaven. I'm generalizing. But ultimately, our hope is not here. If your hope's here, you'll find out you're hopeless at some point. Our hope is in heaven. The kingdom. When Jesus rules, when Jesus reigns, when he returns, and come on, Lord, come on, and makes everything right, then that's the hope. If we hang our hearts on any other hope, we will become heartbroken, heart sick, heart sore. It's a heartache tonight. <laughs> that's for you, Rick. So one more. One body, one spirit, one hope. Ultimately, that's the only hope we got. Because nobody's going to get out of here alive. And then he says, one Lord, that's of course Jesus Christ. And then one faith, that is the faith in Christ, in God, as revealed in the Bible. That's faith. You know, sometimes we'll say that uh, the, another world religion, well, they're of another faith. No, they're of a totally different altogether. You know, we talk about world faith and ecumenalism, and let's get all the people together, and let's get the, the, the movie stars and the celebrities and the singers all to stand on stage and hold hands and sing, we are the world, we are the... No, no. That's not the kind of faith we're talking about. We're talking about one faith in one Lord. His name is Jesus. He died on the cross. He rose from the grave. That's where our faith is. That's what he's talking about. And then one baptism. Now, if you like to write in your margin, write down 1 Corinthians 12, 13. This is the spirit baptism. When a person accepts Jesus Christ, 40 operations of God happen instantaneously. It's like when a baby's born, he's got all that stuff, but he doesn't know what it is yet. When a person is born again, God does these operations from the inside out. And one of the 40 operations operations that God does, the 40 spiritual operations, is he baptizes that person. The word baptize means to immerse, dip. Baptizo is a Greek word. And he baptizes that person, immerses them, places them in the body, verse 4, of Christ. Now, water baptism ought to follow that. Obviously, there's some of our brothers in other denominations that don't see it that way. They think you have to be baptized to be saved. We don't believe that. We believe you've got to trust Jesus to be saved. Absolutely. And you ought to be baptized after that as a testimony. Absolutely. But this baptism is not water. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Read around in there and you'll see that. This is a spirit baptism that places us in the body of Christ. And we're sealed by the Spirit unto the day of redemption. Always is. That's what Baptists commonly call once saved, always saved. <laughs> Perseverance of the saints, if you like the doctrine of faith. And then he says there's one God. Only who it is, it's one God and Father, he says, of all, above all, through all, and in you all. So those seven things. If you find another believer, whether they're in Pinkyville, or they're in another state, or if they're in the nation of Haiti, or wherever you go, you will see that you have a commonality there. And so the old statement was, in, in, in uh, essentials, uh, unity, and in non-essentials, charity, and in all things, love. That's the idea. Now, write down this summary. I've taken these seven and put them in a summary statement. I'll repeat it several times so you can get it. Here is the seven unities in summary. Our unity in Christ 
is based on faith in the triune God lived out in the body of Christ as we move toward our heavenly home. I'm going to say that again. That's important. See, there's some people who say they're Christian, don't believe in the Trinity. Here it is. But they don't believe that. And you'll meet some of those people. You may have some of those people you work with, some of those people in your family. I've learned how to get along. Our unity in Christ is based on faith in the triune God lived out in the body of Christ as we move towards our heavenly hope. One more time. <coughs> Our unity in Christ is based on faith in the triune God lived out in the body of Christ as we move toward our heavenly <coughs> home. Then look at verse 7. He shifts gears here now. And this is going to get into next week and beyond that. But he shifts from our unity to our diversity. And, and he moves from words like one and all towards like each and every. He says, verse 7, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. See, the beautiful truth is it's our unity that fuels our diversity. When I know who I am in Christ, what I have in Christ, then I live out who I am in Christ freely and I accept you because you know who you are in Christ and what you have in Christ, and you're living out who you are in Christ for you. And we live together, we enjoy one another, we fellowship. I saw a perfect example of what I'm thinking about. Many years ago when I was a young guy, on Fridays we'd load up the car, and the kids had two at the time. we drive from beautiful Graceville, Florida, where I was a student, Baptist Bible Institute, now called the Baptist College of Florida. And we drive about 100 miles down towards Port St. Joe. It's down on the coast where we started a little church called Higher Creek Baptist Church. And there was a flower farm there on the, on the road. I don't know if it's Highway 77 or Highway 71. One of the two. I can't remember right now. This is south of Bluntstown, Florida. And Sherry always wanted to stop and look at the flowers. A lot of driving, so we're going to get there. You know what I mean? Any of you ladies ever been with your husband? He's going to get there. Got to get there. Can't stop. Got to get there. Any of you guys got to get there? You know what I'm saying? So we had to get there because we left on Friday. Had to drive all the way down from the central time into the eastern time zone. So we lost an hour of driving. Got to get there. Got to get there. Then the next day I'd visit. And then on Sunday morning we'd have service. And then Sunday afternoon we'd drive home. And then I'd get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and go to work at the maintenance department. And then start school at 1 o'clock that afternoon. That's ancient history. But anyway, one day, I finally got the sense about me. The light bulb came on, and I decided to stop. Mm -hmm. And we got out. I never will forget it. There she stood, out in that beautiful field of flowers. There was asters and begonias and bogavillas. Gerber daisies, hibiscus, lantana, and oleander, and her favorite, vinca. <laughs> she loved those little white vincas with the red around. And we bought some at the flower farm that day. We planted them in a big old oaken bucket, and they grew. And she, she was standing out in the middle of this beautiful field, this beautiful variety of flowers. And she said, I wish I had a camera and you could take my picture. I never will forget it. I still got the picture. I didn't take it, but I still got it. And that field was so full of variety and color and texture and shape and beauty. And that's what we are. That's what God sees when he stands out in our field. <clears throat> and it's our unity, these seven unities that we hold on to and don't let go of that free us up to be all the rest of it, as you'll see. So don't try to make somebody be like you. Wouldn't it be boring if we were all the same? 
<laughs> no, that would be terrible. But we learn to appreciate one another and to value the diversity that springs and blooms and blossoms and buds and throws fragrance everywhere for the world to see and be drawn to. We're always pulling out the flowers we don't like. The world is not drawn to that. But if we're nurturing the flowers that exist and they're sprouting and growing, the world is drawn to that. They say, what is that? And we say, this is Jesus. This is how he does it. This is his body. So four final statements, if you'd like to write these down. Four simple, practical <clears throat> statements about how we can obey this command in verse 3. Not creating unity, that's man's way, but maintaining, tending, nurturing this beautiful field he calls the body of Christ. Number one, be intentional. I get that from that word in verse 3, endeavoring. Unity, my brothers and sisters, is never an accident. No person, marriage, family, or church ever drifts together. you got to work at it. <clears throat> so you have to be intentional. You know, somebody said to live above with saints we love, oh, that will be glory, but to live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. <laughs> so realizing that we sometimes rub each other the wrong way, we sometimes see things differently, acknowledging that, but being intentional to look beyond that. And to focus on those things that make that one. Those things that keep us united. Those things that keep us together. Be intentional. Number two, be reasonable. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> Verse two, notice what he says. With all lowliness, meekness. It might see, your version might say humility there. Gentleness is another version. Long-suffering, patience. You got a King James and you got long suffering, put about 18 O's in there. Long suffering. Forbearing one another in love. There it is. So be reasonable with people that you may disagree with, see things differently than. Um, as I've told you for many years, there's more important things in life than being right. We just need to love and let God. Sort out a lot of things. Unless somebody's living in sin or somebody's, you know, preaching that Jesus is not just that, that's different. You know, the Mormons got a different Jesus. The Jehovah's Witness has got a different Jesus. I get I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about us who are united on these seven unities. Be reasonable with your brother. Be reasonable about sister, your sister. Everybody's struggling with something. Everybody's going through something. And you don't know about it. So be reasonable. Number three, verse two, be relational. We have a tendency, I think it's unconscious and unintentional, but sometimes it's not, to only be around people that we want to be around. To select the people that we like, they like us, and we hang out, and we don't really mix and mingle with too many other people. We're safe there, we're protected there, we're comfortable there, we're in control there. That may not be God's perfect will. God may want you to start meeting and mixing and mingling with other people. Because as you do that, then you get a confidence to go out and reach people that's not even here yet. And one of the main reasons people don't go out and witness and share Jesus because they're not talking to each other in the church. You've got to watch that. We've got to be relational. We're all part of the body. There in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, Paul says, The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The hand can't say to the ear, I don't need you. That's absurd. So be relational. Reach out to others. Talk to one another. Get to know each other. I told you before, God puts people in your life for a reason, but it's your purpose to find out who those people are. There may be people right here, right now, that can help you out and get you over the hump, and you don't know who they are. God puts the answers all around us. That's what the body of Christ is all about. And then finally, number four, be prayerful. 
It's not really in the text, but obviously we need to pray about this, don't we? We need to pray about our unity and keeping it together and using it as a weapon against the disunity and the fraction and the friction and the tension and the pressure and the schism we find in the world. Dividing up into all kinds of lobby groups and political groups and gender groups and my group and that group and the other. Jesus wants us to be united so we can impact all those groups. Call the peace prayers from Francis of Assisi. You've heard it before. He's the patron saint of animals. <laughs> God never told animals to be in unity, but he told us to. So let's not act like animals. Let's act like God's people. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there's hatred, let me sow love. Where there's injury, pardon. Where there's error, the truth. Where there is doubt, the faith, where there's despair, hope, where there's darkness, light, and where there's sadness, joy. O divine master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. One more passage. Flip on back to the book of Psalms. I know you thought I was done, but I wasn't. Now watch out. Sometimes I'm not filling your curveball. Psalm 133, and then we're going to close, I promise. Thank you for your attention. The year was 1986, and I was a young guy in Bible college, and the strangest thing in the world ever happened to me happened to me up at that time. Some stranger things have happened since then. But up to that point, somebody didn't even know, hollered my name. I walked over. His name was Joe. Joe said, hey, I'd like for you to give the devotional talk at the next SGA meeting. Well, SGA was something we did once a month, Student Government Association. Nobody knew me from Adam. I don't know why he picked me out. But I got the joy of very early in my career of speaking to the entire student body and faculty. And I went to this passage, Psalm 133, and this was the devotional I shared that day. I'm sharing it with you because it's my favorite passage in all the Bible on this wonderful subject of unity. David says, behold, literally take a look, observe how good how pleasant it is for brethren and sister <laughs> to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment on the head that ran down to the beard, even Aaron's beard, went down to the skirts of his garments. It's like the dew of Hermon, and as the dew that descended upon the mountain of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even his life forevermore. David says three things here. He says unity is beautiful. It's wonderful. It's a, it's a precious thing. But then he compares it, verse 2, to oil, and verse 3, to water. What do we know about oil and water, class? They don't mix. There's only one place in all of the universe where oil and water mix, and that is on the mountain with the high priest. Jesus is our great high priest. If you go up to the mountain and meet with Jesus, that's where unity will be found. That's where the seeds of unity will be found. Because Aaron was a picture of the high priest. They put the oil on him to anoint him for service. And the mountain, of course, I can only think of one mountain. And that's the mountain where he hung on that cross for our sins and their many. And yet, if we want unity, we'll only find it in him. Not in denominations, not in doctrine, not in anything else you can think of or the world could create. Our unity is in our Savior and our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. And as you heard Allison saying, there is peace in trusting the Lord. Do you know him today? You need to come to Jesus. You need to come back. You need to do something in a relationship that's been broken or fragmented. 
Do you need to mend the fence? Do you need to be the peacemaker? Do you need to one that unifies and puts it back together? That's what our invitations are this morning. That we would live in and enjoy unities, unities in Jesus Christ. Father, what a joy it is to know that we can have what we already have. We can enjoy it, we can recover it, we can rediscover it, we can replicate it. As Assisi said, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Help us, Lord, as we trust in you to be just that. Help us to take the next step. Help us to go the extra mile. Help us to forgive. Help us to let it go. Help us to realize we don't have to be right. Help us to realize my brother and my sister are valued because you're our Father. And that's one of the unities. Our God and our Father of all, in all, and over all. <laughs> so we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you make it possible for people like us, as David said, to dwell together. And we know as Jesus prayed in John 17, he said, Lord, make them one as we are one. And we realize that a church that is unified can do a lot of things to glorify God. But a church that is not can be an instrument for the enemy. And at this time, Lord, when so many churches and groups and Pastors are being vilified by the culture as people seem to be dropping out of church and walking away from the things of the faith. Help us to remember that if we keep our eyes on you and lift you up, you said, and I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. Lord, we've even read the last few weeks of awakenings and people seeking you, college students, questions being asked, is this a revival? What's going on? And we know that revival begins with desperation, a realization that we can't do it, we need your help, and seeking you and allowing you to lead and guide and do what only you can do. So, Father, we just pray that this unity would be something that we would desire to devote ourselves to, and that you would use this unity in the body of Christ to do that awakening, that revival, that reaching of others change this next generation and give us mercy and extended grace in our nation as we seek you, as we seek your face, Lord. We thank you and praise you for your mercy and for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together. This will be our hymn of invitation. This altar is open if you'd like to pray. Seek the Lord. If you have a decision, accept Christ. Some other personal response to him. Now's the time to respond. So Oh. Um. 
just come home. His arms are always open. The invitation never closes. He welcomes each one and every one to himself. Six o'clock tonight, the fusion event. You're all welcome to come back, experience that. It's our church, Buck Freeman, First Baptist, Hope Spirit, I think. There's a little unity there. How about couldn't get them all, but got some of them. <laughs> and that's better than nothing. So God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great afternoon. See you at the band concert. Yeah. Yeah.